Chapter 3. Energy, Motion, Vibration Man is living in a universe of ceaseless vibration, but is conscious physically of such vibration only in a minute way. He is affected through his sense of hearing by something over ten octaves of sound vibration and through his sense of sight by one octave of light and color vibration. There are countless billions of vibratory waves of electricity, heat, light, and color, etc., that apparently make no impression whatever upon either his senses or his physical body. Billions of vibratory waves are constantly passing through his body, yet he is all unconscious of what is taking place. With his mind, he may determine mathematically the number of these vibratory waves, but apparently he is only slightly attuned to them and feels comparatively little of their action in his physical life. Vibration on every plane of being differs in degree, but not in kind. No matter whether we call it molecular, atomic, or spiritual, all three may differ in degree, but not in kind. It is the same vibration from the highest spiritual plane of being to the lowest plane of form. All vibration is the result of energy in motion. Energy in rhythmic, vibratory motion has produced every form in the universe, and energy in discordant motion is destructive of all form. Different degrees of vibration affect us in various ways and degrees. 1800 volts of electricity will destroy human life, while 2 million volts passing through the body of man seem to produce no harmful effect. In the act of hearing, somewhere between 25 and 40 per second of molecular vibratory waves marks the beginning of the average man's power to hear, and somewhere between 30 and 40,000 waves per second marks the end where the limit of hearing is reached. It is to be noted, however, that some people are more delicately attuned to both sound and color vibration than others. They begin to hear at a lower rate of vibration and continue to hear the higher sounds, and see more wonder of color long after others have ceased to sense them. There is no question that the great painter sees far more color in the varying hues, tints, and shades that he uses than the person who is not in sympathetic relation to them, or, I might say, than the one who is not so highly attuned to them. Some writer has said, Color is sound made visible, and that sound is color made audible. Just as musical sounds differ in sound, pitch, and quality, so do colors differ in three respects, hue, tint, and shade. Although sound is the result of molecular vibration while color is the result either of atomic or electron vibration. The scientific theory of molecular vibration is that it is not the air which is moved, but the molecules in the atmosphere that any vibratory body causes them to vibrate in the same manner. Perhaps a bell will illustrate the meaning. When the gong of a bell strikes, there is a vibration set up which disturbs all the molecules in the bell. These, in turn, produce a vibration of those outside, and these, in turn, impinge upon other molecules farther away from the bell, and thus vibratory waves are set up, which undoubtedly extend far beyond the power of the ear to hear them. The vibratory waves set up in the bell radiate, as do the rays of the sun, in every possible direction. Each molecule communicates the impulse it has received to the next, and, having done this, returns to its normal state of repose. With electricity, heat, and light, the same process takes place, but in different degrees. A molecule is an aggregation of atoms. Until recently the belief has been that the atom was the smallest conceivable particle of substance in the universe, that the whole visible universe was a grand aggregation of atoms. With the discovery of radium there came a deeper unfolding of the secrets of life, and the electron took its place as underlying the atom, and man went one step farther toward unraveling the mysteries of life. It is to be noticed in all such steps, however, that the tendency of science is from the visible toward the invisible. Energy in motion produces all vibration, but we do not know what causes the energy or what sets it in motion. All atomic or electron vibration is set up by the activities of the sun, but of the causes lying back of these activities we know comparatively nothing. We know that electricity, heat, and light are the result of energy in motion, and we believe that this energy produces atomic waves, and that the different degrees of these set up among the atoms produce the phenomena of all three, and the different degrees of length and velocity of these waves produce the three different phases of the phenomena of electricity, heat, and light. Doubtless, we shall yet come to know that besides molecular and atomic, there is also electron vibration, but what the latter vibration may produce no man can as yet definitely say.
We know so little about the whole subject of vibration and the various phenomena produced by it, and there is so much yet to be known, that the deeper we go into the matter the more wonderful does it all become. Vibration, from first to last, is a unity of motion and must be considered as such. Although in its manifestation it becomes a trinity of molecular, atomic, and electron vibration producing varying degrees of wavelengths and differing in velocity of movement. There is so much to be observed in common between sound waves and color waves that eventually it will become a thoroughly accepted scientific belief that there is a continuation by varying octaves from the lowest to the highest sound, and from that on, from the first color, red, to the last one of bright violet. It will consequently be found that the vibration continued beyond the bright violet, when man has become attuned to a higher rate of vibration, will disclose itself as the beginning of a new octave of color, and that man's hearing will also be able to translate into music the higher sounds which, as yet, have not become musical to his ear. Still further octaves of sound will be added to his hearing, and further octaves of color to his seeing. There is a very close analogy between sound and light. For instance, both possess the same properties of being refracted. We say certain surfaces absorb so much light and reflect so much back. It is exactly the same with sound. A smooth or polished wall or ceiling will reflect a part of the sound back again, while curtains, carpets, etc. will have a tendency to absorb to a greater or lesser degree, according to their varying surfaces. While every tone travels through the air with equal rapidity, each tone has its own length. Exactly the same is true concerning color vibration. A sounding board in a piano, the woodwork in a violin, the roof of the mouth, and the resonant head chambers used in voice production all act to give increased volume in sound production, but do not change the wavelength or cause greater velocity of movement. Resonance, however, means greater volume of sound, and because of increased volume there will be increased molecular vibration in the atmosphere. Man's physical senses bring him into the closest relationship with his outer environment. His five senses may be summed up as differentiations of one sense, namely, that of touch. Touch, in the first degree, brings man into the closest relation to material things. Next we find that various things coming in touch with the palate act on the sense of taste. Again, by the way in which different perfumes and odors come in touch with the olfactory nerve, the sense of smell is made evident. In a still greater degree, by the way that atmospheric vibration comes in touch with the tympanum or drum of the ear, the sense of hearing is affected, and the last or most remote degree of touch is the way that color or light vibration comes in touch with the optic nerve of the eye. It must therefore be evident that four of the senses viz, taste, smell, hearing, and seeing, are only different degrees of the one vital sense we call touch but it is with the sense of hearing and seeing that we have most to do in this book. There are two peculiarities that I should like to make clear concerning the sense of sight and the sense of hearing. The eye receives pictures from without, and, as a general thing, the pictures it receives affect man's mind far more than they do his feelings. Sight is the sense of touch that is farthest removed from man, and his life is usually not nearly as much. Disturbed by what he sees as by what he hears. In other words, seeing is more of a mental process than any one or all of the other senses. Hearing, however, seems to be more of a process of feeling. Let me illustrate it in this way. We might see a building burning at a distance without our feelings being affected to any marked degree by it. But if we were close to it and could hear the cries of distress coming from those unable to escape, not only would our minds be quickened, but all our feelings would be aroused. With the aid of our eyes, we take in pictures of objective life. With the aid of our ears, we come in touch with man's more subjective life. Objective life tends to awaken man's mental faculties, causing him to think and to reason, but it does not necessarily stir his deepest feelings. People who have lost their hearing and who no longer hear the harmonies of sound usually become irritable, while people who have lost the power to see and yet have retained their hearing are usually both gentle and kind in their natures. I do not mean to say that there are not exceptions to this rule, because one may have lost the outer hearing and have kept the sense of the inner, and have all the sweetness and gentleness that is to be found among the blind. We might mention as an illustration of this inner hearing that Beethoven, while of a somewhat irritable temperament, which was hot improved by the loss of hearing, nevertheless was able to hear with his inner ear, 
and produced more of his beautiful and remarkable music after he had practically lost the use of his outer hearing. Dr. Nicholas Saunderson, who lived in the early part of the last century, although blind, was one of the most celebrated mathematicians of his time, and he said, Persons who are deprived of sight are generally blessed with a fine ear. Hence, perhaps it arises that music is a favorite study with the blind. The doctor was a singular instance of this delicacy of ear. He could readily distinguish to the fifth part of a note, and by his performance on the flute, which he had learned as an amusement in his younger years, discovered a genius for music that would probably have appeared as wonderful as his excellence in mathematics had he cultivated the art with equal application. In the development, then, of the mind and body, through the use of music and color, one must take into account how color affects the mind and how hearing affects the emotions, and it will be through the union of both that the greatest development will come both to mind and body. Very often doctors recommend a change of scene to patients who are not improving under their care, advising them to go to different places in the hope that their health may be restored. Now, if a change of scene is oftentimes necessary to restore health, how much greater must be the result arising from a harmony of sounds coming in touch with and arousing one's inmost feelings? For feeling is the dynamic that moves all life. We are what we are far more because of what we have felt than because of what we have thought. It is through our deepest feeling that we come into vital touch with God and man. I have elsewhere stated that the body of man, when in a state of harmonious vibration, is also in a state of perfect health and strength. This physical vibration is, without doubt, dependent on harmonious thoughts and feelings. Therefore, that which produces the greatest harmony of mind and feeling must, of a necessity, be the greatest agent not only in restoring mental poise and physical health, but also in keeping a person harmoniously balanced. But vibration may be either a means of building up or of destroying. The story told in the Old Testament about Joshua and his chosen followers marching seven times around a walled city, each one of the number blowing a trumpet, brings out the thought that it was through the united, rhythmic vibration of all the trumpets blown in unison that the walls were overthrown. The people who believe in the infallibility of Bible records look upon the overthrowing of the walls of Jericho as nothing short of a miracle, while people who do not accept the letter of either the Old or the New Testament look upon it rather in the nature of a Hebrew myth. I feel quite sure that sometime in the near future science will demonstrate the possibility of an entirely different theory. We know that the Egyptians were in possession of a wonderful knowledge of the secrets of nature, and that Moses was thoroughly versed in Egyptian occult lore, and that he, in turn, was enabled to impart this knowledge to Joshua. The overthrowing of the walls was the result of a direct molecular wave action one produced by the trumpets sounding at some definite range of pitch so as to cause all the molecules in the wall to respond, and the constant repetition of the sound brought about the destruction of the walls. Perhaps this could be best illustrated by an army of men crossing a bridge, all keeping step. At first there would be a slightly perceptible movement of the bridge, but from the first movement on it would become an ever-increasing one, until without the breaking of the step, in many cases, the bridge would be destroyed. We are only beginning to understand a little of this great question of vibration, but that little shows how wonderful is the power with which we are dealing. I know there are many who will assert that music and color vibration can have no direct action upon man's physical body, and therefore can possess no real value for the cure of purely physical diseases. I wish to state, however, that there is a direct physical action resulting from both sound and color vibration. Let me illustrate this. As I sit in my study, with doors and windows closed. I am conscious of many sounds rising from the street below. Now all these sounds can only reach my hearing through molecular sound waves. Those waves before they can be translated into sound by my ear must penetrate and pass through what we call solid matter and set up molecular vibration in the very room in which I am sitting. Furthermore, they must set up the same vibration in the wood, glass, or walls through which they pass. Now, if this be the case, as scientists affirm it is, is it reasonable to suppose that this molecular vibration exerts its influence only on my ear and does not extend to the whole physical organism? No, the body of man is more fully alive and in a far more rapid state of vibration than wood, glass, or stone, and for that reason molecular sound vibration must exert even a greater influence upon it. 
and there cannot be the slightest question but that the molecules of the body are affected to at least the same, or even a greater, degree than those in the wood, glass, or stone. I assert, therefore, that there is a direct physical action produced by molecular vibration upon the body of man, and of whatever quality the initial vibration may have been, whether it was rhythmic and melodious or unrhythmic and discordant, the original vibratory wave is followed by exactly the same kind of waves from first to last. For instance, if one should ring a silver bell, the only difference produced by its sound to persons standing at different distances from it would be that the one who was nearest to the bell would hear a greater volume of sound than the one who was farthest from it. But the silver quality of the sound would be exactly the same to both. An iron bell, if sounded under the same conditions, would convey to the same listeners a harsh iron sound or tone. What I desire to show by this is, we know that the melody and harmony of sound vibration must of a necessity produce melody and harmony so long as that vibration continues. Therefore, since melodious and harmonious vibrations impinge upon the ear and produce identical molecular vibrations in the body, it follows that these harmonious molecular vibrations of the body would later become fully expressed in physical health and strength, while inharmonious molecular vibrations would give exactly the opposite result. People might retort by saying that the musical vibration that would set up harmony of vibration in the physical would only have, at best, a momentary or passing effect, and there, for could not be of permanent value. In reply to this, I would say that constant repetition of musical vibration would tend to eventually establish a permanent condition of harmonious physical vibrations. It is a well-known fact that once you have established a habit of body or mind, it be coem, es easier to live that habit than to depart from it. Therefore, for such reasons I maintain that once you systematically set up rhythmic, harmonious, molecular vibrations in the body, it will be far easier to retain that condition than to depart from it. Sometimes when one is listening to vocal or instrumental music a note is sounded, or a chord struck which sends a vibratory thrill throughout the whole body. Without doubt, the note or chord made its appeal to something very deep in our nature, to something in the subconscious mind of the past, or to some deep passion or emotion of the soul. Therefore, it is obvious if one note or chord can set up a vibration, as it were, involuntarily, how much more deeply might we be physically affected by vibrations consciously prolonged with a view to the regeneration or revitalizing of mind and body. There must be persistently directed effort to the full awakening of the highest, as well as the deepest of the soul's emotions. For we live at our greatest when we feel the most. When mind and body vibrate to soul feeling, all is well. For the melody of life comes only from within. The soul alone can build our minds and fashion our bodies. The soul alone can give melody to mind and symmetry to body. I maintain, then, that all molecular vibration sets up an action of the molecules of the body similar to that produced in the first instance. That harmonious musical vibration produces exactly the same kind of vibration in man's physical organism, and therefore no one can question but that music does act directly on the body of man. Now let us go a step farther. Does color produce a similar action? We are told that as the rays of light touch the optic nerve, we see. Now, according to the length and rapidity of these waves, we see different colors. Scientists tell us that light waves result from the vibration of atoms. As the atoms are so much smaller than molecules, they are not affected by the atmosphere in the same way as are the latter. The vibrations of electricity, heat, and light are infinitely more rapid. The same question, therefore, confronts us in relation to atomic as to molecular vibration. Does such vibration coming in touch with the optic nerve end with that contact alone, or does it exert an influence on every atom of man's body? Without doubt, that which affects the part must act equally on the whole. Whether the vibration be molecular or atomic, the whole body is affected, and it is only a question of degree, not of kind. A thorough investigation will ultimately show that there is even an electron vibration which has its influence upon the body. We know so little as yet concerning vibration, and there is so much to be known, that even in our wildest flights of imagination we cannot conceive of the full effect vibration has had on life nor the still greater effects it will have when we consciously come to understand its use aright and so obtain from its still greater results. Now I come to what I consider of far more importance than the explanations just given of the action of molecular and atomic vibration upon the body, namely, 
the action produced upon one's feelings. A note struck on a musical instrument will sometimes cause a note in another instrument to respond to it, and as a result a new vibration is set up. In the same way rhythm and melody vibration come in touch with the rhythm and melody in the life of man, and new vibrations are set up. It first of all reaches the soul of the man who is receptive to it, and extending to his mind, and then to his body, produces exactly the same quality of vibration on all three planes of being. This vibration continues on its outer movement and touching the bodies, minds, and souls of other people. It affects them to a certain degree in the same manner as the first individual was affected. It is thus, then, music awakens man's inmost feelings, and either sets up in his life or calls out into expression the rhythm, melody, and harmony that potentially exist within the life of every man that cometh into the world. Music and color can, therefore, be used to establish the conscious reality of one's soul, to renew the mind, and to make whole the body. They can prove a perfect salvation for man, a salvation from sin and sorrow of mind, disease and death of the body, and an uplift to his soul. For when man becomes attuned to celestial music, he will pass from under the bondage of the discordant, inharmonious vibrations which are destructive to all form and come under the influence of music and color vibrations which are eternal. Change of thought or change of MMD may have some renewing effect upon the life, but the inner glow of joy or love will make for a new mind, and a new consciousness of life in a way that could never be attained by man's mentality alone. I believe that music may be used not only for the healing of the body, but also for the regeneration of the mind. Music comes nearer to the heart side of life than do any of the other arts and for this reason its influence is greater. There is something else to be taken into consideration concerning the fact that we hear more than 10 octaves of sound while seeing less than one octave of color. This would apparently show a greater development through our hearing than through our seeing. That color has to play an important part in the healing of the sick there can be little doubt, although, at present, its influence is secondary to that of sound. Eventually it may be proved that there are as many octaves of color as there are octaves of sound, and in the process of time, new octaves of sound and color will be disclosed to man. But this will only come to pass when man becomes far more highly developed than he is at present. The more progress he makes in the evolution of his own life, the more will he become attuned to all the voices of nature. With the unfolding of his own nature, there will come an ever new and ever unfolding development in the harmonies of color and sound. All nature will respond to him, will sing him new songs, and paint him new scenes with music and color. In other words, this whole world in which we live is not yet fully created, but is rather in the process of creation. God is using man to create a new earth that will truly represent the heaven that lives in man's highest or spiritual consciousness. For, I hath not seen, nor ear heard, neither hath entered into the heart of man a conception of the glories that God has prepared for him. But that glory has to be worked for before it can be entered into and appreciated. There's music in the sighing of a reed. There's music in the gushing of a rill. There's music in all things. If men had ears, then earth is but the echo of the spheres. We are all engaged, whether we know it or not, in working out our own salvation. We have been provided with a soul to feel, a mind to think, and a body to act with. But only as we use our souls, our minds, and our bodies may it in all truth be said that we are working out a full and complete salvation. Perhaps we know something of the melody of life, but we do not yet understand the rhythm and harmony of it in the sense that we shall some day. For we have hardly yet begun to enter into the joys and beauties of life that will eventually be revealed to the dwellers upon this earth. End of chapter